In video 80 of Tensor Calculus, we'll continue the discussion from the last video. In particular, we'll show how to use the curvature tensor to derive the values for the principal curvatures of a surface. Suppose we have a curvature tensor that looks like this. Well, we learned in the last video that we can find the mean curvature by forming the contraction. So B alpha alpha, the contraction, implies the summation of the elements along the diagonal. So B alpha alpha would be 5 plus 2 is 7. That's the mean curvature. We also learned that the Gaussian curvature will be equal to the determinant of this matrix. So the determinant here, with one upper index and one lower index, is going to be equal to the product of these two elements minus the product of these two. So 10 minus 18 is negative 8. So in this case, the mean curvature is 7, the Gaussian curvature is negative 8. Now we also said that if the curvature tensor is in diagonal form, meaning it has only diagonal elements and everything else is zero, that those diagonal elements would be the principal curvature values. But of course that's not the case here. So what we've got to do is to perform an operation known as diagonalizing the matrix. Now if you've had linear algebra, you know exactly what that means. It means that we first of all have to find the eigenvalues of the matrix and use those values to construct an equivalent matrix. Well, I promised you early on that you didn't need to know linear algebra, so I'm just going to give you the formulas for the eigenvalues. Now, uh, let me mention here that the number of eigenvalues in any given case is going to be equal to the dimension of the matrix. So for a 2 by 2 matrix, we're going to expect to find two eigenvalues. Now, if we have a 3 by 3 matrix, we'd have three eigenvalues, and so on. And we can diagonalize a matrix of any size, but the process of finding the eigenvalues differs. The formula for finding the eigenvalues depends on the dimension. So what I've given you here is just the formula for a 2 by 2 matrix. This formula will give you the eigenvalues of a 2 by 2 matrix. Now, if you want to know where this formula comes from, you can easily go out on the web and search for videos that uh, talk about eigenvalues or diagonalizing a matrix. But that's going to be beyond the scope of what we're trying to do here. So we'll just apply this formula. We've got a 2 by 2 matrix. We expect two eigenvalues. We're going to get one for the positive value and one for the negative value here. So let's just uh, do it. Lambda is going to equal one half of the sum of B11 and B22. That's the sum of these diagonal elements. It's just 7. Plus or minus one half of uh, the square root of all this. First of all, the difference of B11 and B22 squared. 5 minus 2 is 3. So this is 3 squared plus 4 times uh, the product of these two elements, b12 and b21. Negative 3 times negative 6 is 18. So this is what we're looking for. All right, so we're going to have 1 half of 7 is 7 halves, plus or minus half of all of this. 3 squared is 9. 4 times 18 is 72. 9 plus 72 is 81. The square root of that is 9, so this would be 9 halves. Okay, we use the plus to sign here. 7 plus 9 is 16, divided by 2 is 8. 7 minus 9 is negative 2, divided by 2 is negative 1. So what we have here are the eigenvalues of this matrix, 8 and negative 1. The next step is just to form a 2 by 2 matrix in which the diagonal elements are equal to the eigenvalues, 8, negative 1, and we have zeros everywhere else. So what does that do for us? Well, obviously we have a diagonal matrix here, only diagonal elements, the others are all zero, 
But what is the contraction? What's B alpha alpha in this case? Well, it's 8 plus negative 1 is 7. And what is the determinant of this matrix? Well, a determinant of any diagonalized matrix is just the product of the diagonal elements. It's 8 times negative 1 is negative 8. So we have constructed a matrix that's the equivalent of this one in the sense that they both have the same contraction and determinant value. Uh, this, this particular matrix would be a curvature tensor that has the same mean curvature and the same Gaussian curvature, but it also has only diagonal elements. So we can safely say that the principal curvatures are 8 and negative 1. Now it's pretty easy to see that this process is the logical equivalent of rotating our coordinate axes until this element becomes 0. So uh, uh, what it all boils down to is the fact that this formula right here is a formula that will give us the principal curvature values. Once I plug these values in here, the eigenvalues become the principal curvatures. So I don't really need to form the matrix. I just need to evaluate this particular formula. So with that, we can extend the takeaways from the previous video. Here's what we learned in the previous video. We learned that the mean curvature is equal to the contraction of our curvature tensor, and that the Gaussian curvature is equal to the determinant of our curvature tensor. Well, in this video, we now know that we can find the principal curvatures simply by applying these formulas. Kappa 1 is equal to this. Kappa 2 is equal to this one. Now, um, just as a matter of interest, uh, if the off-diagonal elements B12 and B21 are equal to 0, then this term drops out. And if you evaluate what's left, you'll see that this is equal to B11. And this is equal to B22. And this just tells us what we already know. And that is that if the matrix is in diagonal form, where these elements are all zeros, then the diagonal elements themselves will equate to the principal curvatures. All right. Well, what I want to do now is to uh, apply everything that we've learned in this video in the last to the demo that we were working with two videos ago. So let's go see what that looks like. This is the demo as we left it back in video number 78. So today I want to display the curvature tensor. And it's this expression over here. These are the four components of our curvature tensor with one upper and one lower index. The first thing we said is that we can find the mean curvature by forming the contraction. So that would look like this. The contraction is simply the sum of the diagonal elements. So these two values added together give us this. And that's obviously the same as this value over here. Well, next we said that if we find the determinant of this uh, tensor, it'll give us the Gaussian curvature. Well, that looks like this. The determinant is simply the product of the diagonal elements minus the product of the off-diagonal elements here. And that value, again, matches the value of our previous method right over here. And finally, to get the principal curvatures, uh, because this is not a diagonal matrix, we simply plug these four values into our formulas, and we can derive the principal curvatures. And that's what we get right here. And again, these two values equate exactly to the ones we got from the previous method over here. Now, all those, these two methods obviously produce all of the same uh, invariant properties. It may be a little confusing that the individual components of our curvature tensor don't seem to equate to these individual components here. Well, let me see if I can clear that up a little for you. Let me rotate the axes over on the left to a spot about like, uh, where would it be? Right about here or so. It's not exact, but it's close enough to make the point. By rotating these axes a little bit, you notice that this value is equal to this one. This second partial 
is uh, basically the same as B11. This one's the same as B22. Now, the off-diagonal elements right here do not equal this uh, mixed partial over here. In fact, they don't even equal each other. This is not a symmetric matrix. However, the product of these two off-diagonal elements will be equal to the square of this expression. So with that, I think you see uh, kind of the correlation between these individual elements and the elements within our curvature tensor. So now let's move the point up to a different location. We'll slide it up to something like this. And you can see that everywhere we go, the values continue to be the same. So working with the curvature tensor gives us the exact same results as the method we used back in video number 78. And I think you'll have to agree with me that uh, using the curvature tensor is a lot simpler. It's a, a direct application of the components of the curvature tensor, and we don't have to go through the process of transforming our function to various coordinate systems or rotating any axes to eliminate the mixed derivative. Okay, the last thing I want to do is to show you what all of this looks like for our sample surfaces. This is not going to take very long at all. We've already done the heavy lifting by finding the curvature tensors for each of our sample surfaces. All we have left is a few trivial steps to derive each of the invariant properties of the surface. So we'll start with the uh, cylindrical surface. Here's the curvature tensor. First step is to raise the index. We do that with the contravariate metric tensor. Both of these are diagonal matrices, so raising the index amounts simply to multiplying these two terms together and multiplying these two terms together. So this is the result. We've raised the index, so there's one in the upper position and one in the lower position. Next step is to form the contraction of this form, and that's simply going to be the sum of the diagonal elements, and that's what we get here for the mean curvature. Add these two together, we get this, and that's the mean curvature. All right, now we'll find the determinant of this expression, and again, um, we only need the diagonal elements. This time we multiply them together. So the product of these two elements will give us the determinant, and that's obviously equal to zero. And that makes sense because the intrinsic curvature of a cylinder is zero. It is intrinsically flat. Remember, we could unfold the cylinder into a flat surface, so it has no Gaussian curvature. And finally, because we already have a um, diagonal matrix here, the uh, diagonal elements also give us directly the uh, principal curvatures. And those are these values right here. These diagonal elements are the principal curvatures because the off-diagonal elements are zero. All right, let's move on to a spherical surface. Here's the curvature tensor that we derived earlier. The first step then is to raise the index. So we use our contravariant metric tensor. This product here will form uh, B11. This product will give us B22. So here we have the curvature tensor with one index in the upper position and one in the lower position. The next step is to uh, form the contraction, which means we're going to add these values together to find the mean curvature. And that's what we get here. It's the sum of these two elements. And then the Gaussian curvature will be the determinant of this expression, which as a diagonal matrix is simply the product of these uh, diagonal elements. That gives us 1 over a squared. And finally, because we're working with a diagonal matrix, then these elements also represent the principal curvatures right here. Now, all this makes perfect sense. If we're working with a sphere, then the intersection of the plane is going to be the same no matter how we rotate it on the surface. So the principal curvatures will be the same in every direction. And, of course, the curvature we see is the curvature we would derive for a circle of radius A. Okay, so finally let's move on to a torus. We go through the same drill. First, we need to raise the index. So the contravariant metric tensor is here. This product will give us B11. This product gives us B22. And here's the form we're looking for. 
So now we form the contraction here, add these two together, and it'll look like this after we do a little algebraic simplification. All right, and the uh, Gaussian curvature will be the product of those two elements, giving us this. And finally, because the matrix is a diagonal matrix, then the diagonal elements will also give us the principal curvatures, like so. And with that, we are done. Hopefully now you can fully appreciate the power and utility of tensor calculus when it comes to working with curved surfaces.